How's it going, folks? This is Mike, and I'm back for uh, the third part of my top 100 favorite films, okay? Not the best films ever made, but my personal favorites. So this goes from number 50 down to number 26. So starting off at number 50, Casablanca from 1943, I think. This is a film that I think just about everybody loves and everybody points to as, as a classic of that era. Uh, Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman, Paul Henry. Let's see who else. Um, Claude Rains, Sidney Greenstreet, Peter Lorre. It's a, a classic adventure story and probably one of the best love stories ever put on screen. But it also has something, a, a really nice twist at the end where it gives us the message that some things are more important than love. Some things are more important even than being with the one you love. There are things that are worth sacrificing for. And uh, it's a very, very marvelous anime film. Made at Warner Brothers. It was supposed to be just another B film, kind of an adventure film. They originally wanted, um, I think the first choice for the role was George Raft, the, the Bogart role, Rick Blaine. And he turned it down, so Bogart, Bogart got his big chance. Classic film. All right. Next up is uh, a wonderful dramatic musical from 1963. I Could Go On Singing, starring Judy Garland and Dirk Bogart. This was Judy Garland's last film. And she is, in this film, she is at the peak of her powers as a dramatic actress. And she is also, she is also wonderful in all of the uh, singing sequences. Um, she plays a concert singer from America named Jenny Bowman, who, when she was much younger, had an affair with a doctor named Dirk Bogard, an English doctor who was in America studying, and they conceived a child together. He did not know that before he went back home and got married to someone else. And uh, so she gave, she gave birth to, to the child, but she gave the child to his father to adopt. So the child, the son, does not know that his adoptive father is actually his real father or that this famous singer is his mother. So the drama is that Jenny Bowman is in London to do a series of concerts. She wants to meet her son. And it's very, very well acted and um, very, very good. I mean, really worth seeing. If, if your only knowledge of Judy Garland is The Wizard of Oz, you might want to see her as a grown up because she was tremendous, okay? All right. Next up is a classic uh, universal horror film, one of the best. This is from 1932, The Mummy, Boris Karloff, The Mummy. Uh, one of his most iconic performances, really. And I, I think the first time you see this, I think it's one of the most terrifying films ever made because it, it in the opening sequences where the mummy is coming back to life, it, it's one of those situations where the camera doesn't show you everything that's happening and it makes your imagination come into play and it makes it even more terrifying. And if you've seen this film, you know what I'm talking about, but one of Karloff's best, The Mummy. Next up is um, another classic horror film, or at least it's classic to me, from 1935. This is Mark of the Vampire, okay? Mark of the Vampire, uh, directed by Todd Browning, who did Freaks. And um, he was actually doing a remake of one of his... Uh, earlier films called London After Midnight, a silent film made in 1927 that starred Lon Chaney. And in this film, it, it, he actually, um, it, he, he does silent sequences much better than sound sequences. He really was a silent film director. But this film is about uh, a series of murders in a, in a European village where the um, victims look like they, they have been attacked by vampires, okay? So Lionel Barrymore is the star of the film. He's called in to investigate. This this big mystery starts unraveling. And it features a performance by Bela Lugosi, uh, his first appearance as a vampire since Dracula four years earlier. And he doesn't play Dracula, but a very Dracula-like character. And he's joined in it by a young actress named Carol Borland, who uh, made this film and no others. She had worked with Bela Lugosi on stage in some of the uh, performances of Dracula. And she is the quintessential vampire girl with long, dark hair, uh, a porcelain face with big eyes. She's like a reincarnation of Theda Barra. I, I always like this film, I like it very much. Next up is my favorite Star Trek film. This is Star Trek First Contact from the year 1996. It features the Next Generation cast, and it's directed by Jonathan Frakes, who played in the show. And um, this this has a little bit of everything. It has um, the Borg. The Borg make a great appearance. Um, it, it goes back in time where it, it, it we meet the man. His name is Zephram Cochran, who in Star Trek lore was the first man to discover warp drive and therefore open up um, 
to outer space, you know, and to meet people from other planets. And it just has everything. It has very good interaction be between all the characters. Um, Alfre Woodard is in it. She's very, very good in this. And uh, it's also very funny. So I, I, I like all the Star Trek films, but this is my number one, okay? Next up, two films in a row. Uh, the Cat People from 1943 and The Curse of the Cat People, which is the sequel in 1944. The original film is directed by Jacques Tournier and The Curse of the Cat People directed by Robert Wise. Simone Simone, Kent Smith, and um, Jane Randolph. And in the first film, it also has Tom Conway. It's all about a woman from Serbia who believes that she, her, her people, her, her uh, ancestors were cursed in such a way that if she becomes uh, sexually aroused, she is liable to kill the man that she's about to make love to. So when she marries Kent Smith, whom she loves very much, she's afraid to go to bed with him because uh, she's afraid she'll kill him. So this is one of those, this was uh, the first, Cat People was the very first in a series of films made at RKO by a producer named Val Luton, who wanted to show a different kind of horror film than what had been done at Universal and make films that are, um, they rely mainly on the imagination of the viewer rather than showing monsters. So that's that's what he does in here. They use gorgeous film noir lighting, black and white sets. Um, it, it's just tremendously well done. And the sequel, Curse of the Cat People, uses the, the top three actors in the film, Simone Simone, Ken Smith, Jane Randolph, but it also takes it in a completely different direction where it centers on the daughter of Kent Smith and Jane Randolph, played by a fantastic child actress, not terribly well known, her name is Ann Carter, who who begins to imagine that she's seeing Simone Simone, the, the cat woman, even though she she's never met her, she's only seen a photograph of her. So she becomes her imaginary friend. It takes the whole story of the cat people and, and turns it into a child's um, odyssey. It's a fairy tale. And there are a lot of uh, frightening moments, but it's not really a horror film. It's more like a, a really scary uh, kid's story. And it's done very well. Okay. Next up is one of my favorite Woody Allen serious films. And this is called Crimes and Misdemeanors from the year. I'm not sure what the year is. Let me take a look here. Um, uh, 1989. A couple of intersecting stories. Um, Woody Allen is in it, Mia Farrow, uh, Alan Alda, Claire Bloom, Martin Landau, Sam Waterston, and Angelica Houston. And the, the, the main story in this involves Martin Landau as a character named Judah Rosenthal, who was a very successful, wealthy businessman, philanthropist, pillar of the community, perfect family, perfect wife, and he also has a mistress played by um, Angelica Houston, who he's, he's trying to get away from her. And she's threatening to expose him not only for his adultery, but also for some um, financial dealings that were, you know, on, not on the up and up that she knows about, if he does not agree to uh, divorce his wife and marry her. So he has to decide what to do about his mistress. And it's a, it's a great moral dilemma, beautifully played out in this film. Why wow. the nature of good and evil, does God see what people do? Uh, the rabbi in the film, played by Sam Waterston, is telling Judah, the eyes of God are always upon you. It's, it's a very interesting film, and I highly recommend it. Okay, the next up is a classic musical called The Gay Divorcee from 1934. The second film with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Now, the first one they made the year before was called Flying Down to Rio, and they were only supporting characters in that film. But when they danced together, they became a sensation. So after that, they made eight more films at RKO. And uh, one of the most successful musical teams in history. This one I like because it, they were so young and everything was so fresh and there was nothing that was being done over again, you know, re repetitive. It was all brand new and they are so cute when they dance together. Great music, uh, great supporting characters, great art deco sets, just everything. I just, uh, I don't know, just... <laughs> It's just fun to watch it over and over again, which I do. Okay, next film is A Great Departure. This is um, a Mexican film from 1962 called The Exterminating Angel, directed by Luis Bunuel. How in the world do I describe this film? It is so strange. It's probably one of the weirdest things you will ever see. It's about a, a group of very wealthy uh, people who go to a beautiful mansion for a dinner party. And when the dinner party is over, they all retire to the living room for drinks and conversation, and nobody leaves. 
they can't leave for some reason. Of course, they don't realize it at the time. They all just kind of fall asleep or curl up on couches and everybody stays overnight. The next morning they wake up, they have breakfast, and still they cannot leave. They can't walk out of the room. People go to the edge of the room to step over the threshold and they just suddenly get distracted or they, they sit down in chairs like they're exhausted and some, some of them start to cry. Well, so it goes on for weeks. People cannot leave. They're starting to get hungry. They're starting to uh, get thirsty. They run out of all the food that was in the room. And they're so desperate for water that they start tearing down the wall so that they can get to the water pipe so they can all have something to drink. It, it's all about the breakdown of civilization and how people can very easily turn into savages given the right circumstances. And uh, it sounds in a way like it would be funny, but it's not. It's, it's done for a very serious intent and great imagery, great acting, very strange film, highly recommended. Next up is a 1939 Greta Garbo classic called Nanachka. Nanachka from MGM. Um, this was Garbo's penultimate film. She made one more movie two years later that did not do very well and after that, she retired and never made another movie, which is a shame because she was still very young, very beautiful, and a very, very talented actress. Now, most of Garbo's films were um, period films, uh, costume pictures, and she was usually not very happy in her films. But in this one, the big calling card was, as you can see at the top here, Garbo laughs. So it was a comedy, and it was also done... In, in a contemporary setting. It was 1939, it was uh, the war time was building up, and uh, she plays a Soviet communist woman who comes to Paris on business, and she gets caught up in um, the beauty of Paris, the freedom, the feeling, and she's, she also gets caught up in her love for a very dapper uh, man about town played by Melvin Douglas and they meet on the very first day that she's there and she just starts loosening and opening up and uh, she becomes a different person. So it starts out where she's just very stiff and very hello comrade and all this sort of thing and then as she slowly just begins to uh, blossom into a human being it's it's a beautiful performance by Garbo. If, you, if you've never really thought that you would like to see a Garbo film uh, this would be a good place to start. Probably her most popular and, and accessible film. Next up is a classic film noir from 1945 called Laura, directed by Aldo Preminger. Film noir lighting, uh, beautiful sets, just some of the best black and white photography you'll ever see in a film. So every time the camera stops, it looks like it could be a painting. You know, it's just wonderful. Uh, Gene Tierney, Dana Andrews, Clifton Webb, Vincent Price, Judith Anderson, in a story about a beautiful young woman named Laura Hunt, played by Jean Tierney, who was found murdered in the doorway of her apartment. And a detective, um, played by Dana Andrews, can't think of his name now, but it, uh, Dana Andrews plays a part, is investigating. And as he starts spending time in this woman's apartment and gazing up at her beautiful portrait on the wall and having all of her friends and associates telling about her life and, and about what, she, what kind of a person she was, which are shown in flashbacks in the film, he falls in love with her. He's falling in love with a dead woman, which is very strange, but the mystery takes uh, many, many twists and turns. And it also has beautiful music composed by David Raxon. The theme music from Laura, which is repeated almost obsessively throughout the film, became a very popular standard. Okay, the next up, ah, classic uh, movie from 1938. This is Jezebel classic Betty Davis movie. She plays a fiery Southern belle named Julie Marsden living in New Orleans in 1852. And she's uh, involved in a tempestuous relationship with banker Henry Fonda. And she, they have this love-hate relationship. She decides, she's such a bitch, she decides that she wants to humiliate him and test him by going to this, this fancy dress ball in New Orleans where all the young women are who are not married are expected to wear white right for some stupid reason and she decides to wear this garish red dress which was intended for a prostitute to wear she she decides to buy it and wear this thing just to show him up just just to piss everybody off and especially him well she ends up not not only humiliating him and pissing him off but she humiliates herself Things start to happen. He gets married to somebody else, comes back to the South. And what, what's so interesting about this is that Betty Davis's talent and her energy take you from uh, 
thinking that she's just a total bitch. She deserves all the unhappiness she, she can possibly get for the way she manipulates people until at the end she is someone who has learned the meaning of self-sacrifice. And you're immediately back on her side again. It's a great performance. She won an Academy Award, her second. Next up is a classic uh, universal horror film called Bride of Frankenstein, okay, from 1935, directed by James Whale, who had directed the original Frankenstein. Boris Karloff comes back. Uh, also, Colin Clive comes back as uh, Dr. Frankenstein. Dwight Fry comes back, although in a different role than the earlier film. A lot of people think this is... Um, equal or even better well better than the uh, original and i'm not sure i feel that way but it, it comes very close that this this brings so much so much uh, innovation to the whole frankenstein uh story and it, it gives the monster a voice it makes him sympathetic in one scene and horrifying and and murderous in another scene it just goes up and down back and forth there's a lot of comedy very bizarre characters and um the, the Bride, played by Elsa Lanchester, is one of the most weird, absolutely weird and iconic figures in uh, motion picture history. So what can you say about that? Next up is a base. The, the, the film that made, it kind of made baseball a religion or a spiritual experience. This is the Field of Dreams from 1989, I think it was. Kevin Costner, James Earl Jones, Amy Manigan, Ray Liotta. Um... He plays a guy, a farmer from Iowa named uh, Kinsella, who is, uh, I think that's what it is, I believe, yeah, Ray Kinsella, who starts hearing a voice saying, if you build it, they will come. So he builds a baseball field in his field, cornfield, and uh, it turns out to be a portal from some other weird dimension or purgatory or someplace where these dead baseball players start coming back to life and they all play baseball. So... It's a very good film, kind of uh, kind of a weeper at the end. I like it very much. Okay, next up is a very tragic love story from 2005. This is Brokeback Mountain, directed by Ang Lee. It stars Heath Ledger, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, let's see Anne Hathaway, Michelle Williams, Randy Quaid. Now, this is a very controversial film for its subject matter. It's about two young cowboys who, in the early 60s, when they're very, very young, they they go up onto a place called Brokeback Mountain to herd sheep for a summer, and they fall in love. They have a relationship. But they are so inarticulate, and they are so unable to understand what, what they're feeling for each other that they split up at the end of the summer, and they lead different lives, but they never forget each other. And it, the tragedy is that they cannot be together because they can't truly accept who and what they are. And that's uh, that's very well acted, very well done. I, I know a lot of people were offended by the subject matter, but I think that uh, the people who saw it appreciated it for what a great film it really was. Okay, next up. From 1966, this is Blow Up, directed by Michelangelo Antonioni, one of my favorite films. First time I saw this film, I couldn't stand it. I walked out after about... 30 minutes, I thought, what a bore. But later on, many years later, I saw it again. I, now I love it. Uh, David Hemmings, Vanessa Redgrave, Sarah Miles. It was uh, Antonioni's first Eng English language film. And he, he has the, it, it's filmed in uh, the swinging 60s London, okay? It's got that whole ambiance and the clothes and all the, the attitudes, the music, the yardbirds are in the film. Um, it's about a young photographer who is, is uh, living the high life in London and very jaded, very bored. Nothing nothing really moves him or impresses him. One day he's out taking pictures in a park just for no reason at all. And he, he sees a man and a woman who look like they're having a, a very nice romantic encounter. So he starts snapping their pictures. When he takes the pictures home and starts to develop them and blow them up to be larger, he thinks he's seeing a murder right? He sees a body on the ground, just all kinds of weird stuff going on. So he keeps blowing the pictures up to bigger and bigger to find out if, if what he's seeing is real. So, and, and, and that's part of the, uh, the weirdness of the film because he can't decide exactly what is real and neither can the viewer by the end. It's a very strange movie, but I, I think a lot of people will like it if they give it a chance. Next up is a classic Betty Davis story from 1942. I love Betty Davis. Now Voyager. This is the story of um, a woman named Charlotte Vale, a very wealthy woman living in Boston who is uh, under the domination of her mother, played by Gladys Cooper. Great performance. Um, 
she she's this woman is living as a, as a very repressed spinster in her mother's house and she's just totally miserable ends up having a nervous breakdown goes away to a clinic run by dr claude rains and after after she recovers from the nervous breakdown uh, her appearance starts to change. She loses weight. She takes, starts taking care of herself. She goes away on a long cruise uh, around the world where she meets a married man played by Paul Henry, and they fall in love. And because of this experience, she she starts to become a different person. She learns to uh, stand up to her mother. And it's it's a very it's soap opera from start to finish, but it's actually done very, very well. In the hands of a lesser actor, it probably wouldn't have been that fascinating, but Betty Davis is very, very good. Next up is a 1947 film noir called Out of the Past. Richard, uh, Richard, Robert Mitchum, uh, Jane Greer, and um, Kirk Douglas in a story about a man who literally is trying to forget his past with this uh, femme fatale played by Jane Greer. And un unfortunately, he gets pulled back into it, uh, dealing with uh, criminal activity, and he finds himself just bound up with this woman that... Uh, he knows is no good for him. And it's, it's beautifully shot and a very, very good performance by Robert Mitchum. Okay, next up is, oh, this is a great film, Witness for the Prosecution from 1957, directed by Billy Wilder. Tyrone Power, Marlena Dietrich, Charles Lawton, Elsa Lanchester. This was, um, I only saw this movie for the first time, I think it was about a year ago, on the big screen, and it just blew me away. And it's it's got, it's got a lot of uh, fantastic dialogue. Charles Lawton is just, He's like a Shakespearean actor in everything he does, and he a lot of it's very funny. Um, but he, this guy, he just got out of the hospital and he's recovering from a heart attack, and he's he's being um, followed around by his nurse Elsa Lanchester, who's of course Charles Lawton's wife in real life, and they are very funny when they are talking to each other because he can't stand her and he's trying to drive her away, but she won't go away. Anyway, he takes on a case that he simply can't resist. Tyrone Power has been accused of murdering an elderly elderly woman who um, had put him as her heir, get, getting all of her money. So she ends up dead, and they, everybody thinks he killed her. So he takes on this case. He just gets fascinated and pulled into it. And uh, the courtroom scenes are just absolutely fantastic. Wow, highly recommended. Another Billy Wilder film. This is uh, Double Indemnity from 1944. Fred McMurray, Robert Stanwyck, and uh, Edward G. Robinson in, in a film that... I didn't like very much at all until just about a year or so ago, and I was lucky enough to see this on the big screen twice in 2015, and I, I like it more every time I see it. It's a very sordid story based on a book by James M. Cain, and um, in fact, Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck, neither one of them wanted to do the film because they thought that the characters were so unsavory and unsympathetic that it would ruin their careers. But it turns out that it's probably the, the most memorable films that they ever did. So it's, it's a great film noir, great mystery, and everything about it just first rate. Next up is an Italian film, L'Eclisse, which means the eclipse. From 1962, this is from Michelangelo Antonioni, and it stars um, Monica Vitti and... Alain Delon in the the third and final film of Michelangelo Antonio's trilogy about alienation in modern day Italian society. And this is the story about a woman who at the beginning of the film breaks up with her longtime lover and then immediately drifts into a relationship with a stockbroker uh, for no particular reason. And they, they just seem to have no connection and no connection to what's going on around them. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. The story is, in a way, the story is very vague. It's one of those things that you need to watch many, many times. But for me, it has a, a hypnotic effect, mainly for the photography. It just has a, a fantastic sense of uh, of place. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, in fact, I'm probably explaining it very badly. But uh, I don't know. I love these films by Antonioni, and I think this is the best one. So, all right. Next up is one of the most uh, emotional experiences I've ever had watching a movie, and that is The Red Violin from 1998, starring Samuel L. Jackson, Greta Sachi, and, um, let's see, Jason Fleming. This is the story of a violin made in 16th century Italy, and it, it tells us about the man who made the violin and about his wife who's expecting their first child. He gives her the violin as a gift to what he hopes will be their son. And then it traces the violin as it goes from place and person 
place to place, person to person. It doesn't tell exactly how it made its journey from place to place and from person to person, but it, it goes to Austria, it goes to England, then it ends up somehow in China. And the other part of the story is, is in contemporary Montreal, where there was an auction going on of uh, famous musical instruments. And th this is one of them. And um, the, the story in the film, it goes back and forth between the, the earlier times and the present day of the auction. And Samuel L. Jackson plays an historian who is there to authenticate some of these instruments so that people will they know what they're paying for because they're going to be bidding on you know millions of dollars to buy these old instruments and he sees this red violin which uh is kind of a legendary thing for people who know about violins and about music and nobody knows exactly what the story is and why it has that strange coloration and uh so he investigates the story and at the end when he finds out the secret of the red violin it's one of the most devastating things that i have ever seen in a film I can't recommend this highly enough. It is it is haunting and extremely well done. It also has beautiful, very sad music. So anyway, next up is um, a classic musical from 1933 called 42nd Street, made at Warner Brothers, um, directed by Lloyd Bacon. And the, the choreography was done by a man named Busby Berkeley, who became very, very famous for doing these, these wild geometric uh, patterned, musical numbers that were shot from overhead where you see circles and women's legs moving back and forth and all kinds of uh, strange strange angles it, it, this this was the movie that basically um revolutionized the uh film musical in 1933 when sound came in in the late 1920s musicals suddenly became very popular but they were they were always very stagey where the camera was just kind of fixed looking at a stage and people would come in and sing and dance, sometimes not very well. And it was always pretty much the same. So after a, a year or two, audiences became very tired of musicals. Well, this one was something very different. Busby Berkeley tried to, they, they made this into, um, it's a film about making a stage musical, a Broadway musical. Uh, but, but what they show you in, in the musical numbers are things that could never have been done on stage. They can only be done for a film. OK, so it's just an amazing camera work, amazing sets, got a great cast of actors, uh, Warner Baxter, B.B. Daniels, Dick Powell, Ruby Keeler, uh, Ginger Rogers. Now, Ruby Keeler became famous as um, the, the, star, the, the young ingenue who, who goes out and takes the leading lady's place when she breaks her ankle. And then Ruby goes on and she becomes a star. And Ginger Rogers is very funny. Some of the dialogue is terrific, but it's really a very serious film. It has comedy in it, but it's a very serious film about the making of a musical and what happens, you know, behind the scenes backstage. And the final film in my uh, my list here, this is the original Dracula from 1931, Bela Lugosi, directed by Todd Browning. I love this movie. I I know that it it uh, doesn't get a lot of love from many people these days because it, it is very slow and very um, kind of stagey in a lot of parts. Todd Browning, as I said, was much better at directing silent films, and he didn't seem to have the grasp of what it, what it would take to make a sound film in the way that James Whale did with Frankenstein. But Bela Lugosi is magic. As far as I'm concerned, as soon as he walks onto the screen and he stands at the top of that stair staircase and he says, I am Dracula, he is absolute magic, and it never goes away from me. I, I mean, it's always... And Dwight Fry as uh, Renfield, you know, just when, when either one of them are on the screen, and especially when they're together, it's just it's just incredible. So I love it. And that's uh, my very long video for my third part of my list, and I will be back with the other one. Comments, questions?